based on what you look at, um, you know, the markets, the asset classes that you look at, you know, what are markets currently underpriced? What's currently underpriced in markets? And, you know, where do you see the best, biggest risk coming from? What keeps you up awake at night? What keeps me awake at night? Uh, probably my football team losing more than my investment portfolio, if I'm honest with you. Um, look, I don't subscribe to the buy low, sell high. In my presentation, I talked about trends. Mm -hmm. So I could buy something high and sell higher. In fact, the whole buy low, sell high, it's how people regularly end up in the catching a falling knife scenario. And it's a very, for me, I think it's a very inefficient way for everyday people to generate a portfolio that performs consistently. So I don't really know how to answer that question. I say, keep it simple. Let the S&P 500 dictate a direction. Once it's dictated a direction, go to the scanners, let the scanners pick out the sectors and then choose your stocks from there. I think simple is always best. And you know, if you're wrong, that's where risk management and exit management come in. If you look at performance tables, Warren Buffett is mid table, 19%. You look at top of performance tables, trend followers are at the top. There's a, a big fan base for Warren Buffett. Of course, he's done really well, but a huge part of his success is dividends. It's not the stocks that he picks. And to have a huge dividend payout, you've got to have significant sums of money in that sort of approach. So I say keep it simple. Okay, thank you. Uh -huh. Pick on the last point, what, uh, popular question, what, what keeps us uh, or, or myself up at night? I'd say uh, adapting to the changing market environment. It's, it's, it's always been important, but especially in, in recent years. Um, and that includes, I mean, market-wise in terms of the strategy, but most importantly on, in, on the mind, trade psychology, behavioral side. So what keeps me up at night is, is, is learning how to do that, uh, teach that, and ultimately uh, uh, create some kind of a a transformation uh, awareness uh, where we can all benefit. Uh, over the next uh, few years, I think it'll be an ongoing crisis opportunity, and I prefer the opportunity uh, from that. And I think that's uh, was the key theme uh, behind my presentation today. Okay. Um, yeah, from undervalued asset classes, I think a very interesting one is that uh, we are doing a lot in the metal sector as well uh, with our uh, our fund. And uh, one of them is gold and silver. And don't really touch too much others. Uh, but gold made quite a nice run in just a couple of months, like even almost a couple of weeks, you can say. But silver didn't really follow. And mostly they are quite correlated. So we are really looking into, we, we are basically having a strategy where we are having physical gold and silver here in Dubai. Uh, about 95% of all the gold in the world was kind of coming through Dubai. You can buy it somewhere else, but it was probably first here. Uh, so we have really nice partnerships here to actually just have physical gold appreciate in its value over time where uh, last year was a bad year, as in kind of break even year, start and end of the year was same price for, for physical gold. Um, but it's picking up, uh, but silver not yet. So it might be really, really interesting. We, I think that we did a lot on the silver reserves in November and that was kind of the lowest moment. So we, we, we put that one as a, at the right price in the vault and now let it rise over time. So maybe physicals uh, need to not be excluded and next to what we can all trade online and, and uh, through our brokers. Just a quick add to that. Uh, commodities, I, I think, will are super undervalued and will likely lead in the new bull cycle once, if and once we get the shakeout. On the point of uh, silver, uh, it's, it's from a low base uh, f uh, far un uh, from its all-time high. Uh, so it's a truly high beta gold, but of course e timing is important and having the right risk reward set up. So the, the, the latest rollover in, in gold hasn't helped, uh, but silver should be attractive if and when uh, either a precious metal picks up. Can I add something on of gold? Course. Okay. Um, so gold has been in a 13-year co um, consolidation. The trends before 2001 was massive. Since 2001, it's been a sideways market. Kind of look at it almost as a huge cup and handle sort of formation. $2,000 has acted as a kind of ceiling. I think that's an example of uh, commodities markets. They can trend for 10 to 11 years, but they can move sideways for just as, just as long. 
when they do break out, you can expect a 10 year trend. So gold and silver definitely on my watch list because it's looking interesting, but I'm waiting for the breakout. Any other commodities that you see out there? Copper. Uh, copper pre-China reopening was already outperforming year to day. Uh, it, it benefited more after the uh, the positive news uh, uh, from Asia, but interestingly, it sold off early um, on uh, on the actual realization of it. It was overbought at that moment in time. I think there's a potential buy in the dip opportunity if you look at the copper uh, trend structurally. It's bullish, uh, but again, it, it, it's something that you need to watch closely. Apply, you know, a rule-based uh, system and good risk reward. Um, Outside of that, I'll maybe hand back to you. <laughs> maybe a bit off topic, but uh, I think that all the commodities that are needed to create batteries uh, with the current energy crises and uh, upcoming, like also here in the in the UAE, we have the 2050 vision, Saudi has its 2030 vision. Everything is moving towards energy, but where are you going to store the energy? So we use a lot of actual fossil fuels, like a lot of different things are needed to create the batteries that are going to drive your Tesla and are going to drive your other electric cars. Um, we, we've seen amazing projects here in the region with uh, cars that have solar panel on the roof, so you don't need the loading station, but there still needs to be a battery in that car. And those batteries are mostly manufactured out of a couple of really difficult to get uh, uh, resources and those will become more and more tradable also to the common trader just on the on their brokerage platform so i think that that's something to really look out for uh, just a quick comment uh, if i may on commodities you picked on a, a, a clearly a key point for all of us uh, look up fang 2.0 uh, it was uh, created by Bank of America. It's it's a new acronym, not for stocks, but for industries. And many of them are inflation proxy industries like commodities. So F for fuel, A for agriculture, second A for aerospace and defense. No surprise why that might be included. Um, and uh, N for nuclear. And then finally, G for gold and metals. So it, it sounds intuitive and, and likely a, a long-term play, but market timing-wise, some of those trends are already overbought and, and correcting. So you do need to, again, apply those rules and, and uh, risk reward. There is actually a commodity on my watch list, and that's palladium. So if you go back to my presentation, I talked about trend, consolidation, and then looking for a breakout to the upside. With Palladium, there's actually a trend consolidation and there's a breakout to the downside. It's currently around $1,800, I believe. So if that, if it continues to weaken, there's a shorting opportunity on Palladium and that trend could last six to 12 months. Thank you. I'm going to open um, the floor to questions. Anyone has any questions for the panelists? Uh, I have two questions. Okay. I think my wife is like. We will repeat the question. Now, uh, the thing is, like, from various answers, from which these stocks, uh, forex, and futures, how can I categorize in terms of uh, uh, annual income, monthly, weekly, and daily? Which one, according to you, is the best in order to go for trying to, uh, from looking for long term, which one I should, you know, opt for? Monthly, which one you recommend and say, maybe, and anybody can take the answer. You guys, okay, you want to go first? You go first. <laughs> um, no, I think that it's really good to split your asset classes in the first place so that then you're on the good way there. Uh, if you put physical gold in a safe, you don't take it out tomorrow or a week later. So, I think that you need to look into the asset class where you say, okay, I'm maybe gonna hold physical commodities for five years minimum uh, but you can trade gold every day as an etf on the on on the exchange market for maybe on your hourly or weekly time frame so i think that's where you might maybe want to look into your asset class uh, also s p investment that's an investment you 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 buy it and you take it or you do dollar cost averaging you stay in it for a longer time but if you want to go the style that uh, the gentlemen here have explained with active uh, choosing a certain stock to trade it, it will depend on the validity of that stock, how long you will stay in there. And you can probably tell me how long. Uh, a quick point on the behavioral side. Uh, so uh, 
either extreme is 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 an issue. <laughs> so concentration risk, putting uh, too many eggs in one basket, is is the metaphor and the story that we all know about. Uh, but equally, uh, over diversification is known as worsification, where you distill your firepower. And I know Warren Buffett. Uh, yes, benefiting more from dividends than from stock selection and, and of course also building up enough uh, equity. Uh, one of the things that he's totally against is, is uh, well, diversification and, and too much of it. Uh, so it, that, that's one quick thing I'll say on either extreme. The other thing is you have to do what works best for you. In my experience of doing the work but also teaching it, everyone has a different temperament, objective and uh, winning, win, winning formula. So can I explain how I did it? Okay, so I think we have to be realistic on what you can achieve with every strategy. I started in 2005, day trading, swing trading, value investing. I didn't really gather much momentum. That's me. I found books like Way of the Turtle by Curtis Faith, how I made $2 million in the stock market, came across trend following. That changed everything for me. So I took on three jobs made as much money as I could, filtered it through the stock market, predominantly US stocks, over the next four to five years. And then I got to a point where I had significant sums in my account where I could start funding my lifestyle so I could cut back on my hours. But effectively, but crucially rather, it didn't affect my compound growth going forward. So if I've got half a million in my broker account and I need 30,000 pounds to fund an annual lifestyle, I can take that 30,000 pounds out and I've still got 470,000 pounds in a broker account to continue growing it forward. So you've seen the returns that are made. So I think people need to potentially look at this sort of funding a lifestyle in a slightly different way. Just um, curious, I mean, do you focus more on technical analysis, purely technical analysis, or do you combine it with some fundamental analysis? I mean, like, what, what are the, like, advantages and disadvantages of doing both? Go on. Go on. Uh, starting point was technical analysis. Uh, I was given a chart years ago uh, doing work experience as a teenager. Uh, didn't quite know what the art form was, but learnt it over time. And then uh, working with an institutional research firm, I realized that there were other experts speaking other people. <laughs> and so through the job, I was forced to understand what they were saying and, and vice versa. Through that, I, I realized that ultimately it's one language, it's markets. Now, the reason why technical analysis tends to win out is because it's, it's facts-based, it's more objective, and we can apply rules on it. And most importantly, in my mind, if we're wrong, we know pretty quickly. And, and, and it's this adaptive side to technical analysis that I think that is so important. Over time, I've realized the best of all worlds uh, is what matters, and, and, and especially uh, risk management. The last thing I would say is cycles. Uh, I've stressed the point several times, and it's not to just focus on cycles and ignore the rest, but please, please, please remember that nothing moves in a straight line. When it does, you'll make money uh, either way, uh, but do uh, realize that in life and markets, things do change, and we ultimately need to adapt to that change. I think we're all three mostly technical analysts here, uh, but if we say that too loudly, all the fundamental analysts leave the room or log out from the from the call. So I think that this is the very interesting part of the two worlds that kind of always uh, like say, okay, if, if you're a fundamental analysis, then technical analysis is just stupid indicators. And then there's people who are saying like, I only believe in a technical strategy and I don't care that the Fed is uh, making very, very big decisions. So I think that it's that yeah, kind of the same, that it is the, uh, the best from both worlds. You can be a technical analyst, but if you don't know it's NFP on the first Friday of the month and the dollar is going to go crazy, then you just should not be in a dollar trade, even though your technical strategy would tell you that morning, this is a great idea, because it isn't a great idea if you have any form of, of risk reward, probably, in your strategy. So I think it's uh, you can't ignore each other. I think that's the most important. But starts from technical mostly, yeah. Um, so I, I take the stance that fundamental analysis is better suited for institutions because they pay a lot of money to companies like your company, Bloomberg, to get news early, Thomson Reuters as well. And so by the time we, the private trader, we hear this news, it's often factored into the market. So you're trading on something that's old. Um, 
where technical analysis comes in is that it can pinpoint where the institutions are and where the momentum is. So we get them to do, as I said in my presentation, get them to do all the hard work. We can find out where the trends are and piggyback the ride. Okay. Thank you. So, you know, for, you know, when you do use, use information, I mean, what would be your best source of information out there? Um, trading view is what I use. That's a uh, online browser, uh, browser package. It's data is live costs you around 300 pounds a year. I mean, I think sometimes people want to become investors without investing in a foundation. So you sign up to free packages, you sign up to all of this stuff that's being thrown at you. People don't really gather any momentum. So I think for me, all I need, my charting software and my scanners. And I've got all of that inbuilt into one 28 inch iMac, which I do my work from. And that's it. I, Everything that you've seen on my presentation, that's not with a news terminal coming in. Uh, price chart primarily, uh, but uh, there are many platforms that people can use. Uh, I've, I uh, actively use Bloomberg when I when I worked for the company and when I had institutions that provided it for me. Uh, but but yes, TradingView is, is certainly a, an easy uh, and widely used one. So that's one I use particularly for presentations uh, and other platforms for uh, tailoring the strategies that I'm developing. So whether it's technical analysis or, or cycles, uh, but to your question, what's what's the most important information? I'd say the information that we uh, invest in ourselves. And, and so education and, and more awareness is uh, always a timeless exercise. Yeah, I see that most uh, often that traders forget that little investment and uh, that is yes it's the software and 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 there's other things from the technical perspective that you need you can invest in courses to learn how to make your own indicators you can create those indicators and then you can choose to sell them but you will work a long time on on creating them in the first place but they try to make that on a windows 98 computer so they buy the 300 dollar uh, trading view subscription but the computer is too slow to actually handle the data so i think that it is just a base investment when you figure out your strategy which you can do almost for free figure out the strategy do it on basic hardware uh, with even maybe a free subscription but when you go live when you choose this is part of your income then you have to invest that little bit to to get it right Can I just add something on the indicators? Uh, just be aware, remember that most indicators are lagging. You don't need to have hundreds of indicators on a chart. If they're all lagging, they're all telling you the same information. Moving averages are perfect lagging indicators. It's really all you need. When it comes to leading indicators, how far an asset will move, support and resistance levels, round numbers. If you buy an asset at $100, it's going to move to $200. So you don't need a lot of indicators on the chart. Keep it simple, keep it clean. I'm afraid we've run out of time. I'd like to thank the panelists for their insights and for the time and for everybody else. Um, we hope that you've enjoyed the discussion as well. Thank you very much. <laughs>